last program, seven boats set off on a 33,000 mile journey around the world. The first night at sea would test their crews to the limit. Pirates of the Caribbean, backed by the hugely rich Disney Corporation, would find that nature has no respect for wealth. We had a very potentially grave situation if that lid had come off but would have sunk very, very quickly. Chemo, the shore manager, would be sorely tested. I knew it was bad, man. I saw this black pearl had come up on my phone. <laughs> Three cheers for Premier Challenge. Hip hip, right. Hip hip, right. Hip hip, right. The Australian entry, strapped for cash and skippered by Grant Warrington, would suffer as well. The favourites, Movistar with Bauer Becking at the helm, would have their hopes dashed. And for Fred, it's the start of months of hell. For event management CEO Glenn Burke, it's one challenge after another. Head into your days, actually, Justin. For our loving couple Maya and Freddie, there's a reality check. Adrian and Helen. And success for the only woman in the race comes at a price. Huge seas and powerful winds attack the fleet on the first night. By dawn, those on board Pirates of the Caribbean are shattered. Paul and I were in the galley. We heard some rattling and banging around the keel. On a better inspection, it became very evident that there was a lot of water coming in through the keel box. It was now full of water under high pressure. And uh, it was very clear that we couldn't continue racing the boat. So now we're going to go to Portugal. Everybody's very disappointed about this. Very more than disappointed. The guys are heartbroken. 6.30 this morning I got a phone call from the Pearl. Basically uh, informed me us they had a situation with the keel. <laughs> Right now, we've basically got our whole team mobilized and ready. We got our four, our two 40-foot containers, our air cargo stuff, uh, all headed to Lisbon at basically five o'clock today. Yeah. Uh, we're all on a bus at eight o'clock tonight, headed down there. Um, got the Green Marine, the boat builders showing up tomorrow afternoon. Boat should be in at some time at noon tomorrow. Uh, we've got a tentative booking on a ship if we need one for the 18th and having the boat to derive uh, December 2nd if we need that. If we can't fix it you know, within a couple days, then we'll put it on a ship and send it down. On the Australian entry, Grant Warrington now has more than funding to worry about. A broken boom and they head for Porto Santo near Madeira. Bauer Becking's Movistar team fared no better. Limping to safety, the events of the night are painfully clear. 32 knots was the last number I saw on the speedo and uh, went over a couple of big seconds. It all went quiet for a split second where we were three kilometers through the air. It basically landed on our nose. I was in my bunk, just heard a loud bang. I thought the rig had come down. It's just like a cannon shot that went off. Looking over the field area, we found a sort of major structural breakage of the field frames and shelves. So that's uh, put us out of the race. And here we are now. Time to rebuild and hopefully get to Cape Town and um, still take this race on. We're on the way south to Porti Mayo. We're, we've a broken boat, so we're going to go down and see what we can do to get the boys out of there and get the boat fixed up. Our boat's been at, on two big ocean legs already, so you know when you see the boat's phone number this, this short into the start of a leg that it's not going to be good news. I think it's important when we get down there that we try and present I don't know, it's going to be hard to be positive because it's fairly extreme damage, but at least be a smiley, happy shore crew. <laughs> well, here we are. <laughs> Porto Santo. I thought I'd come here. <laughs> I think 
things you do in the middle of the night. We'll just get chuck the boom off now and take it up to the workshop. They've already got organised and uh, they've set up some lights here so we can do a few little jobs on the boat. You wouldn't believe it, we found these very helpful people in Porto Santo, just north of Madeira. So what time did you have to get up this morning, Miguel, to come and help us out? Well, we just arrived in the, at the harbour, it was uh, 11.30 yesterday night, yep. local time. Yeah. And you just arrive at 3. Yeah? Have oh, you been waiting? Uh, um, Drinking some coffee and yeah. waiting for us? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here we are fixing the boom. We've uh, almost got the uh, resin off our fingers, but we took the boom off and flew our shore crew down with some resin and some sparb on and uh, put a few bits of carbon sea plate in wrapped the end with carbon they're just trimming it up now as you can see and uh, we're just going to put the reefing jammers back in and put it all back together and we're hoping to be out of here in probably about another hour hour and a half so all in all probably about a five hour stopover which is pretty good we're pretty happy with that Movistar reaches Portugal for Bauer Becking's shore crew the promise of two weeks off following the progress of their team on the water is now a distant memory. So I'll make all the paperwork ready and, and all the organisation that we can ship back. But, like what I said, if you can sell the boat back and grab the, the points who are there, that might be just might be a, a race winner in the end. And one of the other things as well is if we put it on a ship, we should get a 20-foot container as well to put everything in. So that's straight away in Cape Town that we don't have to mess. Yeah, yeah, very good idea. For Fred Barrett, Movistar's technical manager, these are trying times. It's an unexpected stop. Oh, a very unexpected stop. <laughs> we're all on holiday. Well, we were on holiday. Not anymore. I knew it was bad, man. I saw this black pearl come up on my phone. Fuck. <laughs> Well, I'd like you to call me and tell me how good it was going. Yeah. Hey, it's really fun out here. here. You missed it. You're missing it. Come on out here. We had a very potentially grave situation. If that lid had come off, the boat would have sunk very, very quickly. We started to get all our safety gear, our survival suits and everything near the companionway and be ready for a worst case situation. We didn't know what was going on, so it was pretty scary. I guess it's good that you know it happened early, and it's an easy, not an easy ride back home, but you know quite a quick one, and we can regroup and get going again. The amount of work to fix this boat properly is going to take long enough to where it's going to be more intelligent to ship the boat to Cape Town. If we're going to go in 60 knots away in the Southern Ocean, um, the boat has to have complete integrity. Swede Freddie Loof was a late addition to Paul Kayard's team. This is his second Volvo Ocean race. Just two days ago, he and his wife Maya said their goodbyes. They faced weeks apart. For Freddie, the first night at sea has changed all that. Rather than a reunion in Cape Town, he's gone home to his wife and children. You know, the truth about the Freddy situation is that he came to me and said that he felt he should step off. Actually, the day after, the morning after we got back. So I was a little bit surprised by that. But I, you know, to want to do this race, you have to really want to do it. And you have to not be, you have to not be worried about the dangers and risks, or at least you have to be at peace with them. I mean, we're all concerned about the dangers and risks, but you have to be, uh, at, at peace with that risk, and it's not for everybody. Meanwhile, the surviving boats in the fleet race on. Boom repaired, Grant and his crew have rejoined them. Hundreds of miles ahead, the race is intense. ABN AMRO 1 breaks the 24-hour distance record. <laughs> Cape Town, the fleet still at sea, and Chemo has pulled off a near miracle. You gotta look at this like uh, a Formula One race. 
our engine just blew out. Now we're getting our engine fixed and we get back in there and we got a bunch of good guys and we got to go racing. Flying a boat out of Portugal to South Africa is goddamn hard, I'll tell you. Trying to get out of Spain, get the clearance, get the paperwork. You got to remember we had four trucks. We had a boat truck, we had a mass truck, we had a container truck, we had a keel truck. So now you have to move all those things. In Portugal, we could only move between 12 o'clock at night and 6 o'clock in the morning. And to get all that stuff loaded on the plane, basically we almost saved two weeks, is what it is, essentially. In the Volvo Ocean Race, a day is king. A couple yeah. days here and there is a big deal. 20 days after leaving Spain, Mike Sanderson's ABN AMRO-1 storms into Cape Town to win the first leg. I'll be absolutely wrecked. You won't even recognise them from the guys that you saw leaving Spain. I think they're fine. They'll have two beers and they'll start to fall over very, very quickly. Early morning calm greets the arrival of the third boat home, Brazil 1, and her slow progress puts pressure on the arrivals team. Yeah, my dancing partner's um, <laughs> pressure on her. It's a shame. She's uh, building her yeah. energy up. <laughs> We're about three quarters of a mile away from um, the sea wall, so we should be able to see them soon. But we'll see. They've been saying that now for the last hour, so it's getting a bit repetitive. What time did you get up there? Uh, quarter past two. No, and it's now bed. six o'clock, and I went to bed at midnight. So I've had about two and a quarter hours sleep. And, uh, yeah, just about enough of it, really. Well, we've got a bit of crowd control happening here. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's obviously going to tax yeah. all of us. <laughs> Adrian Cahalan, the sole female sailor in the race, has come through the first test with flying colours. We were pleased to see that we were competitive and we were, we were very pleased to get a, a podium finished. The only lady on the Volvo Ocean Race on the boats out there, the navigator representing Australia, Adrian Cahalan. I hope I pronounced that properly. Boats will prepare to leave and they'll be on their way to Melbourne. Yeah, let's spray the champagne, damn it, you deserve it. Celebrations for Adrian are short lived. After guiding the team over a course of six and a half thousand miles in demanding conditions, her reward is to be sacked. Um, well, just yes, so I got t told by Alan Adler that um, unfortunately that, that, that I wasn't going to be needed to do the the rest of the race and I was pretty disappointed about that. Um, you know, I saw you last night, I was kind of wandering around. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, you know, that's one of those things. It's, 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 a, it's a job, they've made that decision. I don't know why. I was disappointed that Torben didn't, didn't tell me himself. You know, I've been with the project for a year and, and yeah, I really enjoyed sailing with Brazil 1 and I, that's why I'm really quite in shock because I really enjoyed the team and I thought we were all doing well and we got a good result. The team fly out, flew out that morning, including Torben, and then I got told an hour later, so I thought it was a bit... Uh, so they're all away? They're all away, yeah. So I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to them or anything like that. And, we're, you know, I've been with the project for a year, so... But still, you know, that's maybe that's the way they deal with it, I'm not sure. Yeah, apparently yesterday they just don't require your services anymore. So, um, Have you got any idea why? Uh, I think there's personality thing quite a lot, I think. Yeah. And um, oh, it's not a very nice thing. Being a female, she can't hump and grunt as much as... Because with these boats, you do need... You need ten people to sail them. And um, if you have nine and a half, it's not quite... Not quite ten, so... It hasn't, it hasn't really happened to me before, so it's a bit sort of um, funny, you know. But, um, but you know, sometimes things just don't work out, and obviously didn't work out for them. So, you know, and so that's why, you know, I'm very upset because I really wanted to do the next leg and I, I wanted to do the race and everything. But if they're not happy with me and it wasn't going to be a good environment, then I, I don't think that's a good thing to be either. So I think it's important that, that it, it ended, you know, if that was what they want. 
So yeah, so anyway, but it's nice to be going home, you know. I'll be sitting back on the plane with gin and tonic and reading Robbie Williams' Feel, <laughs> which I've got in my bag, which someone gave to me. <laughs> well before all this happened. <laughs> Four days behind the leader, but still in good spirits, Grant Warrington completes the leg. We'll just have to wait now for the next leg and see, um, you know, how we how we fare there. It's uh, it's great to have sort of done the miles, and um, you know now we've actually spent more time on the water than you know Kayard, for instance. So uh, you know, he, even though he had a lot of time before the race that we didn't have testing, we actually now have more time than someone else, which is a bit of a bonus. But the money worries are still a problem for syndicate manager Bindi Lockhart. We had to uh, find another sponsor for the second leg. We had a problem with Sunergy, so we had to find another sponsor, which took a lot of time. And um, I do all the PR and the media and all that stuff and um, to make sure that the accommodate, we had accommodation. We didn't have any accommodation in Cape Town, we didn't have anything, so had a lot of busy, busy month. I mean, it's a pretty amazing situation to be in when your 10-minute uh, gun goes and you're still cutting the rubber seals on your dry suit seals to see if your wet weather gear fits and all that sort of stuff, you know. And, uh, you know, obviously we um, didn't choose the right sails at the start and all that sort of stuff, but, you know, it just didn't matter at the end of the day. We just wanted to get out of the water and, um, you know, learn the boat, which we've now done. And we're, you know, we're all very fast learners. So. <laughs> It's also a learning curve for CEO Glenn Berg's team. I guess everybody's feeling a little more refreshed than a couple of days ago. There's certainly the faces look a bit brighter and sparkier. But one thing I want to do is to initially just review what we did with arrivals because I think we managed to successfully burn out nearly everybody on the basis of three boats arriving over the course of two and a half days. So I'm not dead sure that what we did was all that efficient. After the first call out, I went back to the duty office at HQ and then I got them to change the system. And I don't know what system's in place now, but it's a, a hybrid of neither what I requested nor what we had before. What we did magnificently successfully is waited around for about eight hours for the arrival of the first boat. And I think we got a little bit better towards the end, but there was still a lot of waiting around. This was our first arrival, so people wanted to be there. I understand that. But I think we can be better. I think the PR team doesn't need to have three people there all night for three consecutive nights or whatever it was. Star at 20, please. Bauer Becking's boat, Movistar, makes a belated appearance in Cape Town. Unlike the pirates, he's chosen a seaborne route for the stricken yacht. Uh, Mr. Pilot, which crane are you going to use to discharge the Movistar? Mobile crane over the other side over here. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, the wind started to pick up and then the vessel started to roll and pitch, so we had to uh, inspect the lashing uh, periodically, at least once every hour. I heard that I had a pretty rough trip in the last couple of days, so everything looks okay. So. As per my instruction from, from my boss, they said take good care of that boat. <laughs> yeah. The repairs to Movistar can now continue. But after the dramas of the first night, and knowing the next leg will see the boats enter the treacherous southern ocean, Technical manager Fred Barrett is starting to fear for the safety of the fleet. They will be very tired boats. Uh, they'll be very tired boats by Melbourne after the first leg in the Southern Ocean. They'll be very, very tired boats by Rio. And then they'll just probably hang in there all the way to the finish. When we get to Sweden, I might hire a big skip and put on a Volvo 70 wrecking yard because really at the end of the race they will be absolutely rooted. Seven o'clock tomorrow, she's out. These guys have busted their butt getting this thing kind of finished up. We've got a lot of people, put a lot of manpower on the deal. What we try to do here, and luckily there's enough people to do it, is just try and keep to a 10 hour day, yeah. not burn the guys out, and just have to get more manpower. Just get more guys in here and just get the goddamn thing done. And I think we're on schedule, so 
we'll see if the thing comes out tomorrow. Put the keel on, hopefully put the rig in, hopefully the wind dies. And hopefully they go sailing, hopefully they go offshore, hopefully they go away. Hopefully I don't see them until Melbourne. <laughs> On Movistar, the keel rams are still a worry. Fred oversees another change. Okay, so the boys are putting the, the revised titanium rams there. You can see that on the starboard side, which is where you'd interviewed me almost a month ago. What we've had done is a piston replacement, just based on the issues that Ericsson have had. We did a, a check on these and found there to be no problem, but with everyone else having to make a change also, we've got it proven that we've just followed suit. Let's get everybody in the battle stations and we'll wait for the moment. On Pirates of the Caribbean, Paul Kayard heads out to sea to put their repairs to the test. It's nice to be in Cape Town. Bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on, man. Attack, attack going up a little or what? It's too far down to attack, I think. No? All right, coming up. With pirates at work, Glenn and ABN AMRO 1 skipper Mike Sanderson go out into the water to pursue a very different challenge. This is a bad boy. I think I will make that harness, Stewie. Uh, I, just, okay. I enjoy being here, you know, it's, not, it's good, good to do something different. And this is so different to what we do, it's fun, you know. Hectic action. You know, I think we've replaced hunting with uh, competition. Oh, this is big. I don't know what I'm You know, you get back into your native element when you're a hunter and a gatherer and you walk out of a cave and, and you have to avoid the same two tigers and you go and slice up a wildebeest or whatever. Gander, gander. You're pulling on it, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's pretty cool. I mean, when it when it goes and you're having quite got your footing, you're off to the side of the boat, whether you like it or not. Wow. Uh, I've had easier days, actually, <laughs> Justin. Well, I think it's coming, actually. I think I'm winning, but... <laughs> Now I'm in the money. Now I've got the most weight of fish. Right. Don't know whether I've got the biggest, but I've got the most weight. <laughs> nice. Back in the harbour, pirates at last have reasons to be optimistic. We're back. We're in one piece. Sounds like it went well, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty happy with everything. Yeah, they didn't call and come in, so that's good. Now they seem happy. So nice haircut, dude. Yeah. For the children of Cape Town, the presence of pirates is reason enough to take time out. I got that one. What do you have to say? Is it good to be a pirate? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. You like pirates? Today is a chance for Good Pirates PR and generates more awareness for the upcoming movie. We want to bless you. You look great. Pirates, now let's say the biggest African goodbye ever. The balls of more love, more love, and it is. Time to get back to business. Ahead lies the Southern Ocean. The next leg of this 33,000 mile adventure will bring more drama, more heartache. What is about to transpire will sorely test the spirit of some.